Welcome to this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade Podcast, where we look forward to shaving every day. Welcome to episode 116 of the podcast. My name is Rick DeWeese. I'll be your host this week. This week, we'll talk about the weekend shaves of the day, only because it was Thanksgiving and, well, I didn't record a whole lot. <laughs> However, this week was a little bit more of an in-depth experience with my valet auto strops, and I now have two, and uh, we're going to go a little bit more in-depth. We're going to do a little in-depth discussion about the the VC1 and the VC2. Um, I've got a VC4 on order, and uh, hopefully when it'll get here, I'll talk about it too, but... We do talk about VC1s and VC2s uh, this week. I throw in a shave of the day in the middle of all that. We have an update in the uh, History of Shaving video series. Uh, need to throw that in there. So if you haven't checked it out, go uh, go to the uh, blog post and uh, go to the page that says uh, History of Shaving video series. Uh, click on that page and all the links are there for your viewing pleasure. <laughs> so I was driving down the road and uh, I was having a little bit of frustration with a truck, specifically a semi-truck on a very small secondary road or perhaps even a tertiary road. Got me to thinking. <laughs> then on the way home, a way that I don't normally come home usually, had to go by way of interstate and noticing that People have absolutely forgotten how to drive and how to be courteous to each other, well, on the road. And then, lo and behold, I get home, and what do I find? Somebody posts on Facebook, good buddy of mine, uh, that there's one state thinking about a slowpoke law. <laughs> it's just, it was just too much. So we throw all that in there. And then, unfortunately, today, something absolutely tragic happened in California, and, uh, a while ago, before it happened, I found a blog post that uh, I thought was uh, very well put together, had a lot of good information over at the Art of Manliness, and that was what to do in the case of an active shooter. And so we'll talk about that. And uh hate to end on that note, but it is reality, and it is here. And uh sometimes it's like the cold sting of a styptic pencil or a a hard splash of aftershave after a, a rough shave, and reality kind of hits you in the face. Well, yeah, it's like that. Anyhow, let's get on with this thing. Okay, well, it's a uh, bit of a drippy morning. I haven't seen rain like this in a while. The rain is uh, kind of a drizzly-type rain, very reminiscent of my time in Seattle or over on the uh, the west coast of france it's very uh very similar to that they used to call it the sunshine of the north over in france <laughs> yeah anyhow shave of the days okay now there's a reason that uh, there are multiple shave of the days included here and it's mainly because it's been the, the thanksgiving holiday and well <laughs> i haven't recorded anything thought about it haven't done it <laughs> imagine that gee <laughs> anyhow Okay, so I have been on a bit of a kick here lately, and I have been studying and perusing and looking, and, well, I purchased one, and I'm looking for a couple more, and I'm talking about valet auto strops. Now, the valet auto strop is, uh, is a single-edged brazier <clears throat> that, at its inception, had a rather proprietary, uh, single-edge blade. It did not have a spine like some of the more modern single-edge blades do. And uh, in fact, I don't know if they can be re-honed. It's, it's interesting. I've got a few that uh, maybe I wouldn't mind trying, but uh, I'll have to figure out angles and things like that. But uh be just kind of an interesting thought experiment, if nothing else. But uh, one of the things that can be utilized for the uh, valet auto strop is the feather single-edge blade. Now, when you look at the feather single-edge blade, it's got some weird cutouts in the center of it. I, they really are. They're just bizarre. And you look at them, you go, what is that? And I haven't checked. I have to check the packaging to see if it's the... The, the Japanese name for something that just happens to align. But 
The, uh, the reason that it's curious is that there are multiple different versions of the uh, Valet Autostrop. The first one is called the VC-1, and in the VC-1, the, the back of the blade kind of slides into a spring holder and is aligned by, uh, by tabs that are on the back of the blade. And this does a very nice job. Now, one thing that's really interesting about that particular blade, or that particular uh, auto strop, and in fact, that's the first one that I had, is that the the blade itself is essentially the top cap. There is no uh, cover or anything really for the blade, and so the top cap really doesn't exist as it would in an ordinary razor. So uh, it, it does give a unique kind of look to it. A tad intimidating for the uninitiated, but at the same time, it's, well, rather cool. Um, and I have remarked on several occasions that my, uh, my auto strop with a feather blade is, is essentially the equivalent for me, anyhow, of a lightsaber for stubble. Uh, it's just a fantastic setup. It really is a great razor. Um, and I have really enjoyed both having it and using it and uh, all that. Well, the other day I was searching around on eBay and I happened to cross a VC2. Now, a VC2, as I understand it, what happened was back in the day the VC1 valet was doing pretty good business and uh, you could actually take some of the other types of single-edge blades, very similarly to what you can do today, pull the spine off of them and uh, actually modify a single-edge blade to work in a VC1 autostrop. You can't do that with a VC2, a VC3, or a VC4 because they have little, I don't know, uh, call them tabs, I guess, uh, they, they have a specialized blade holder, and they have tabs. And those tabs happen to line up perfectly to the cutout of the word valet on the blades. Which is really curious, because the feather blades will work in these razors. They don't say valet on them. There's something else in it. You know, I don't know if it's, if it's Japanese for something. Uh, but... The cutouts happen to fit perfectly. I, I'm hoping they designed it that way because it, it does work beautifully. But uh, so I got the VC2, went to put my blade in it, and came to the realization that not only will the blades fit, but that they will also only fit one way. If you try to put a, a you know, one of the feather blades in upside down, it won't fit because the uh, the cutout doesn't align with the tabs. <laughs> so it will only fit one way. Okay. Um, a tad inconvenient, but okay. And that, of course, leads me to wonder, uh, when they did the valet blades, did they hone them differently on one side versus the other to give a better shape? I don't know. Curiosity. So... I put my, my feather blade into my VC2 uh, auto strop, and there is a bar with the cutout that says valet on it that uh, kind of slides over or, or clips over um, to hold everything in place. And then the whole thing kind of falls down onto the, uh, onto the bottom cap uh, that you then lift up into place with the lever in the back. Now, the thing that was interesting is that on my VC1, there are very prominent uh, hooks where the edge of the blade actually is covered at the outside ends so that you don't have a sharp edge that can scratch, scrape, and or cut you. They are protected. They are covered. And in fact, if you look at almost all single-edge razors in existence, um, they have that. If they don't have that, they essentially work like a shavette and, and peel skin off your face. I mean, that's just kind of the way it is. Um, but the, uh, the thing that was interesting is that on the VC2, on my new auto strop that I got, um, there are no hooks. There are bumps. 
And these bumps are supposed to cover or at least protect the uh, the edges, the, the ends, if you will, of the blade. Now the problem is, is that if the blade is not put into the holder as far back to the rear pivot as it will go, um, the blade will not be protected by these bumps. And in fact, the blade will ride up on top of these bumps. And when that happens, you think everything is good, but in fact what you have done is taking a, a razor that is probably a, a 6 on the fat boy scale as far as aggressiveness, and opened it up to about a 15. <laughs> because the bumps hold the blade above the, uh, the open comb, and you have a gap that is pretty much enormous. Uh, and so uh, using it in that condition is, well, very akin to using a straight razor on a stick. Um, yeah, even more so than normally. So it's, uh, hey, it took me a while to figure that one out. Now, once I figured it out and, you know, this is, well, not really disassembled everything, but, you know, lowered the bottom plate, lifted the razor holder up, unclipped the razor, slid the blade all the way to the back pivot as far as I possibly can make it go before clipping it back in place, lowering it, and ensuring that the edges of the blade are indeed protected by the bumps and uh, that everything is good and it behaves just like a normal valet. <laughs> So a fine shave was had, and uh, yeah, fine shave is right. It's like, you know, Mantic recently on Sharpologist did a review of the One Razor and said that it was a very, very nice shave for him. In fact, it was an excellent shaver for him, and that particular razor uses the feather blades um, exclusively. And I can definitely see how that would give one a fine shave because, quite honestly, I use those in my valets and they give an immaculate shave um, as close to straight razor uh, smooth as, you know, as I can get. I mean, I can't get any smoother with a straight razor. I really can't. So three passes... Safety razor, um, yeah, it's uh, it's good stuff. Holy cow. Uh, I am a big fan, big fan of uh, Valet Auto Strops. And in fact, I'm, I'm uh, looking right now at a couple of the other ones. I'm looking at a, a VC4, which instead of having an open comb, has a, uh, has a bar. And then the, the VC3, and it's also, the, the VC4 and the VC3 also have... Uh, a little bit different blade holding mechanism. Um, still has the tabs. Now the other thing that's interesting is from what I understand the the tabs uh, were put into place because huh, our buddy Gillette bought the Valet Autostrop company and wanted to ensure that uh, that people used the uh, the Valet blades that they were selling exclusively. Um, okay. Uh, I could see that happening. I can see Gillette doing something like that, knowing that he was prone to uh, to manipulating the interior of his razors to make sure that only his blades fit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I get that. That sounds like something he would do. But uh, the VC ones, um, they will hold the uh, you know the original Valet blades, of course, and as well as the feather blades, as well as you know you can modify. Uh, just single edge blades to work in it as well. So I have not done that yet, and uh, I may have to try that one day, but uh, haven't done it just yet. Anyhow, the uh, that's been the the, the razor and uh, and blade combination that I've used the last couple of days, and the shaves that I have been able to achieve with that have been wonderful, absolutely wonderful, beautiful, beautiful shaves. Um, smooth, uh, you know, BBS without effort. I mean, you know, three passes with a very light touch and, uh, and some touch up and it's just, it's wonderful. It really is. 
And of course, you know, every time I do that, I think, how did we get away from this? <laughs> now, the other thing that was interesting is that I was listening to uh, Wet Shaving News. Now, Wet Shaving News is the uh, the, the podcast that is hosted by a Sharpologist, so uh, I'll put a link in it, but uh, it's a good podcast. I really do enjoy it. But they were making a statement that uh, reading, I can't remember, it was like business news or something, and it was a statement from uh, from Gillette and uh, didn't make a whole lot of sense. They said that, you know, the, the cartridge blades that the average user um, did like 170 some odd strokes uh, per per shave. And it's like, really? 170? OK, so just out of curiosity, I, you know, and, and the. The guys that were doing the podcast, they couldn't figure out what the heck Gillette was trying to say, if it was, you know, if they were counting per blade, if it was really strokes. I mean, you know, just, just what the heck they were talking about. So I just, just for the sake of argument, I counted. And with my valet autostrop, and I have a tendency to take a little bit shorter strokes with my valet, um, and I don't know why, it's just, but, but I have a tendency to, but I counted. The first pass was all in all about 60 strokes, okay? Uh, and I can see that because you're trying to get, you know, fairly, you know, the big stuff off and, uh, you know, knock it down to something reasonable. The second pass took about 40, and the third pass took about 40. Well, there's 140. Now, then I throw in a little bit of cleanup, and I'm about, oh, I don't know, maybe 30 strokes there. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, I'm right in the 170 range with a three pass shave and some touch up. So it was a, it was difficult as a listener trying to figure out what the guys on the podcast were saying, just as they were having difficult, difficulty figuring out what Gillette had been trying to say in the number of strokes per shave. Um, because I'm sitting there going, well, geez, I use about 170 for a three-pass shave with touch-up and get wonderful shaves. And because I'm using, you know, double-edged blades or single-edged blades, you know, even the feather blades are, a, you know, they're a dollar a piece. Okay, I get that. You know, they're probably the most expensive ones that I've got. But at the same time, I'm getting, you know, th probably about five shaves out of them. So, how much is it really costing me? Twenty cents. So with twenty cents out there, you know, versus four dollars, uh, you know, I don't know. It it was just it was odd. It was one of those things where you're listening and you're doing the math in your head, going, "Wait a minute, that just, huh?" <laughs> so uh, anyhow, give give wet shaving news a a, a listen and. Uh, Listen to their segment. I can't remember exactly where it is, uh, but it's it's you know their 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 podcast is a is a short podcast, so it's not uh, it's not too hard to uh, to listen. It's not like trying to listen to mine, <laughs> but they do a good job over there. Anyhow, it was an intriguing thing, and it got me to thinking. And uh, you know, it was one of those things where you go, "Well, okay, let's try this." But I'm thinking most people that are doing uh, three pass shaves, a little touch up, or somewhere in the 150 to 200 range. You know, I, granted that's a pretty broad range, but that's uh, that that's where I would put it. Anyhow, that's uh, huh, that was the brief experiment that occurred because of listening to somebody else's podcast. Okay, so let's take a little bit more in-depth view of a valet auto strop. Specifically, we'll start off with the, the one that I've had for a while, which is the VC1. Now, just so you know, um, I've got a lot of pictures incorporated into this description that are in the show notes. So if you happen to be on uh, on iTunes, just uh, just click the uh, the the header the, the header picture and the show notes should come up. And I I think it'll work with pictures. Otherwise, go to the blog spot because I got a lot of pictures that, that kind of explain all this. But the thing that's uh, that's most interesting, I guess, or most prevalent about the uh, the Valley Autostrop, the VC1, is that it has a a rather small 
um, and very uh, easily made, inexpensive blade holder. Um, it just it wraps around one of the uh, the stropping bars. You know, they've got little rollers in here that. Uh, that are gear driven, which just make the thing cool. It's kind of a steampunk look to it. It's it's just cool, but uh, you know it's got uh, it's got a piece of brass that is wrapped around that, and that acts as the blade holder. And it's a, a really nice design. Anyhow, when you take a closer look, um, if you look at the side view of this thing, you can see that on the open comb on either end of the open comb there are two hooks. Now the two hooks are what is used to guard against the corner of the uh of the single edge blade so that you don't scrape your yourself with the uh with the edge in the corner of it. Otherwise, you know, like I said, it would be, you know, just another shavette just tearing your skin off. But, you know, all single edged razors, or at least all that I've ever had and seen, have those uh some kind of protection for the corner of the of the blade. And this one is just it's basically just a, a part of the open comb that is a little bit longer and turned up the other way. Again, very nice design. Okay. So if you if you then look at the spineless feather blade, the spineless feather blade has two half round cutouts in the back of the blade where the spine would normally be on a single edge blade. Now, you take the blade and very carefully so that you don't cut yourself, and it's not difficult. Um, you slide it into the holder. Um, from one side, and one side actually is flared out a little bit to make the job a little easier, and you slide it in between those uh, two little, uh, you know, two pieces of brass until it contacts a, a little tab in the back that aligns perfectly to one of the half round cutouts. And then at that point, you kind of slip it into place, and another uh, kind of sprung piece clips into place and holds the other half-round cutout just perfectly. And again, there's pictures of this uh, up on the blog post, and so uh, it may be easier to uh, to envision this with pictures. But needless to say, it's uh, it's a very simple, uh, elegant, and, uh, you know, system that works. And it works well. The other thing is that the blade doesn't care which orientation you have it in. You can put it in one side first. You know, if you're looking at a blade, you do it left side first, right side first. It doesn't matter. It doesn't care. It's just looking at those half-round cutouts. Um, and that is a nice feature. It is not finicky at all. It's uh, just, you know, you slide it in there and you're good to go. The only problem and the only potential difficulty is is that you are sliding a blade and you do have the chance of cutting yourself. Although, quite honestly, if you cut yourself doing that, eh, maybe you shouldn't have sharp objects at all anyhow. <laughs> but that's just me. Okay, so now that you have the blade in place, now that you rotate the blade down toward the, uh, toward the comb, and uh, when you're doing this, in order to uh, rotate the blade holder in and out, the comb has to be in the downward position. Now, if you look at the back of the razor, there is a little tab, and it's not much. It's maybe uh, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, maybe just a touch more that extends out beyond the uh, the plate that the handle screws in. But if you take your thumb and press on that, the comb will slowly rise up. Well, at least as slow as you're pushing down on it. And what happens with the blade in place is that between the uh, the comb assembly and the blades and the and, and the blade and the hooks, the hooks will uh, mate in, into the blade, and the blade just basically slides into the hooks, and everything is just aligned perfectly, held in place perfectly, and you, the the corners are protected. Things are nice and tight. Things don't wobble around. It's all good. Again, a simple, elegant solution that works. Now, the, the thing that's neat about it is that once you're done with that, again, because the, the blade holder is about the size, rather interesting, but it's about the size of the spine on a normal uh, single-edge blade. 
so that's that's basically what's holding it. You you basically have a spine that is holding it that happens to be attached to the razor. Pretty cool. Again, a simple uh, design. Um, it, it looked, you know, just looking at it, fairly easy to manufacture, and uh, and it works. Now, it it looks a little wicked. It looks a little scary because there's no top cap. You know, your your face is basically riding right up against the blade, and that may be a little nerve wracking for some people, but it's not really. And while not exactly a mild razor, it's a great shaver. I mean, it's not terribly aggressive. I mean, I'd put it maybe a five or a six on the on the uh, uh, fat boy scale, if you would, probably a six, eh, maybe a seven, but uh, I'd call it a six, okay? Because it's really not that bad. Um, and once you get used to it, the one thing that you'll notice about it is that with the feather blades and with the blade orientation the way it is, this is a razor that you use with no pressure. <laughs> just none. You don't need any. Just the weight of the handle and the razor alone is just, it's enough to give you an absolutely fantastic shave. Beautiful design. All right, well, it's a foggy morning out here this morning. That's okay. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the first of December. Holy cow. Uh, the year is ticking by quickly, isn't it? Yeah. So I have been uh, perusing on eBay and uh, looking at things, and <laughs> I uh, I have coming to me now a uh, Valet Autostrop uh, VC4. I never had a VC4 before. I have a VC1 and a VC2. Well, now I will have a VC4, and the difference, of course, for a VC4 is it's a different uh, clipping mechanism for the blade as well as a straight bar instead of an open comb. So it'll be interesting to see when that comes in. Anyhow, the shave of the day today was uh, with my uh, Valet Auto Strop, my VC2, the uh, the feather blade that fits it so well. And uh, for, the, uh, for the soap, now the soaps that I've been using the last, uh, oh, I don't know, four or five days has been an Edwin Jagger soap. Um, a puck of Edwin Jagger that was uh, sent to me uh, by a listener, and uh, thank you very much. And I have been, I've been intrigued by this soap. It lathers very, very nicely. Um, it has pretty good cushion, and uh, the glide is, um, I don't know, the glide is probably middle of the road, maybe a little on the light side, if you will. It's uh, it's not as slick as some, um, and it could be a little bit better, uh, but it's not bad for what it is. Now, the the one thing that I have noticed, it is, it is a very thirsty soap. Um, in order to get decent lathers out of it, I've had to add uh, two tablesp- or two teaspoons, excuse me, keep wanting to say tablespoons, te- two teaspoons of uh, of water um, to the old salsa bowl. And uh, that gives me a very nice, consistent, uh, you know, lather. Um, so it is a bit of a thirsty soap, but, but that's okay. The The end result is a, uh, is a, a fine shaving soap. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with the soap. Um, you know, it's not... <laughs> I remember uh, one that I tested that was made by a soap manufacturer here locally who said, yes, it's a shaving soap. <laughs> I tried it. No, it wasn't. <laughs> you know, it's nothing like that. It's a, it's a very nuanced thing when you start getting into uh, uh, shaving soaps, in my opinion, because, well, a lot of them are just so good. Um, so you're talking about finite points. But the, uh, the Edwin Jagger soap is not bad. It's... Uh, it's I, I have not been disappointed with it at all. Now he did when he sent it to me. He did say, "Yeah, I've had this for a while," and uh, he told me the scent of it. And quite honestly, I'm glad he did because I can't pick up anything in it. <laughs> it has lost its scent. Now it may, you know, once I get down to, uh, you know, kind of like a uh, kind of like a, a Tootsie Pop. Uh, once I get down to the uh, to the Tootsie Roll Center, I might be able to get to something that uh, that has some smell, but uh, but on the outside, anyhow, it uh, it doesn't really have any. 
But it has done a very nice job, and uh, the combination of that soap and the uh, Valet Auto Strop, uh, the VC2, and the Feather Blade have been giving me uh, BBS shaves for the last couple of days. And uh, it's interesting. I have not, you know, I've commented a couple of times that I have not been able to get a real BBS shave without kind of having to work at it with a double edge. Not the case with the Valet Auto Strop. The Valet Auto Strop is, well, the closest thing that I have to a straight razor on a stick. I mean, it's, uh, you know, a straight razor has always given me a, an impeccable shave. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is I've noticed that there is a, I don't know, a certain feel, if you will, to your skin when you have that, that BBS shave. Not when you're feeling it, but just in general. And uh, that's uh, it's kind of unique. <laughs> but uh, I, I've always had just a little bit of difficulty with a double-edged blade uh, doing that. But with a single-edged blade, I guess it's stiff enough that I don't have that issue. And the uh, the valet does, a, does an absolutely excellent job uh, getting it done, as it were. So finish that up. Uh, again, the, the soap <clears throat> didn't have a whole lot of uh, smell to it, if any, that I could detect. So... Uh, Seeing as how it was a neutral soap, I finished it up with some uh, with some bay rum, uh, some Ogallala bay rum and uh, and cedar. Uh, so threw that on. Wife was out of the house, so hey, <laughs> I can do what I want to do. It's uh yeah, one of those things. Anyhow, it is a good shave of the day. Although it is a foggy morning, um, hopefully this fog will burn off and we'll have a little bit of sunshine today. And uh, Hopefully the day will be as cheery as my disposition. So now let's move on to the Autostrop VC2. Now the Autostrop VC2 is a little bit different animal. First off, it has a very large, thick, well, large anyhow, blade holder. And if you look at it, it says valet on the top of the blade holder. And there are two indentations, or what look like indentations. And it's the, you know, on part of the V, and uh, over on the E, there are two, like I said, indentations. Okay. So, in order to put the blade in, you rotate this thing up, and when you rotate this thing up, there's this nice little bar that has all these cutouts on it. And when you first look at it, you're like, what the heck is that? Now, once you open this thing up, you realize that what this thing says is a valet. And in fact, a valet is cut out on this bar. So you have this, this uh, holder or top cap. And then you have a hinge mechanism in this top cap. And then you have a, uh, a bar that comes down on top of this assembly, if you will, to hold everything in place. Does not seem like a simple solution. However, the one thing that can be said about it is that you're, you're just dropping a blade in place and then closing the bar on top of it instead of handling the blade and potentially cutting yourself while you slide it into the holder. Okay, that's the only upside. Because with the uh, with the feather blades, the feather blades have these cutouts in the middle of it, and that does not correspond. I looked at the box. That does not correspond to anything that I can discern anyhow on the box. So I have no idea what those cutouts are for or what they signify, or anything like that. If there's somebody out there that knows, uh, let me know, because it's a bit of a mystery. However, if I look inside the blade holder, the two uh, indentations that I talked about earlier are actually two uh, raised tabs. Now, those raised tabs align with the cutouts in the blade and allow the blade to be put in in one orientation only. If you put try to put the blade in upside down, it won't go because those uh, tabs won't index the blade correctly, and the blade won't sit down nicely, and nothing will fit. And so, once you get it in place, then you put the uh, the the bar on it and snap it in place, and the tabs again 
line up with where the uh, the cutout in that bar says valet. Now, it, it, okay, it's unique, it's nice, but wow, talk about complicated. To take a simple and elegant design, um, it's a bit much. And the other thing is that it does not necessarily hold the blade perfectly stable. It the the blade can move just a little bit. Um, and so it's, it's a bit finicky, quite honestly. Okay, so now that we have the blade in, we rotate the blade over, uh, you know, above the comb, and we have to lift the comb up, just like in the other, um, uh, auto strop in the VC1. Now, the thing that's, that's interesting on this is that the tab has, uh, some, I don't know, they're, they're notches, I guess, in the back of the tab to kind of help you get a little bit more grip on it. And as you raise it up, you realize that there's a couple of things that are different in the front of this razor. Um, first off, there are no hooks at all. You think to yourself, okay, how does this protect me from the corner of the razor? And upon looking, there are no hooks. There are just little bumps. Okay. Um... Okay, I guess. The bumps themselves look about the same width as the actual razor blade, so they're not substantial at all, and quite honestly, when you first look at them, you think, this is not going to work out well. <laughs> but it does in the long run. However, you have to be careful. It is a bit finicky, and you can, um, if you're not being careful, get the uh, and you don't have the blade aligned properly, you can actually get the blade to rise up on top of those bumps. And what that does is open up the gap in this razor and turn it into a super aggressive monster. Um, basically on a, you know, a 0 to 10 fat boy scale, it goes to about a 15. It's still usable and you can still shave with it, but it will, uh, huh, it will test your, uh, your limits. That's for sure. And, uh, that's what happened the first time I did that until I said, wait a minute, this can't be right. Took a look at it and went, oh, that's what's going on. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that the, the comb assembly itself actually engages or slots into the blade holder to prevent the blade from rising up off of the comb. So, apparently I had the, the blade just completely misaligned and allowed me to uh, create a, a, a monster of razors. Um, because looking at the system anyhow on one side, it looks like it is trying, like anything, to prevent that from happening. However, it did. Again, this is, it works, okay, and it works okay, but it just seems, first off, there are more moving parts in this animal just because you have the bar, you have the hinge. Okay, you have the bar and the hinge, so that's two extra moving parts that really are not needed because the, the old design was pretty good. Um, your blade alignment isn't quite as stable and secure as the old design. However, again, it was uh, Schick in his infinite wisdom trying to make sure that, you know, you just used a valet blades because any other blade would not fit. Now, you can modify single-edge blades to fit in a VC1. You can't do that with the VC2. It has to have those cutouts. So it kind of makes it so uh, you only have one shot. <clears throat> so, uh, new and improved. <laughs> there you go. A little insight into the VC2. We have some updates in the History of Shaving video series. Uh, Cheap Shaver over there has been uh, hard at work, and he is now up to part seven. So... So far, we have, uh, uh, you know, the, the part one, uh, part two was Schick, then uh, Aqua Velva, Gillette Strikes Back, the British Invasion, and now we've got The World is Flat, and the Old Spice Mug Soap. And uh, yeah, Old Spice actually did something very similar after watching the video and learning a little bit about how that came about. They kind of did the new and improved thing as well. But they did have a good reason. So go to the uh, the podcast uh, web page, the blog post, and uh, click on the History of Shaving video series page. 
and uh, check out some of those uh, videos and check out the old Spice Mug Soap and uh, you'll know what I mean when I say that they did the new and improved. But, well, they did have a reason for it at least. You know, I, I gotta say, trucks on secondary roads is just, oh God, it drives me crazy. And the worst part is, I don't mind. Okay, so I'm driving down this road here. The speed limit is 45 miles an hour. There is a truck that is driving, that is backing up traffic. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there's got to be 80 cars behind this truck. And this truck is driving at 30 miles an hour, mainly because he has no idea, no clue whatsoever where in God's name he is going. <laughs> Now, what amazes me about this is that in today's day and age with technology, with Google Maps, with, you know, Garmin's, with TomToms, with, you know, navigation aids out the wazoo, uh, how is this even possible in today's day and age? Or is it one of these situations where, yes, I'm a truck driver, but I shun the new technologies and and I will drive aimlessly around at low speeds trying to figure out where the heck I am. <laughs> it is incredible. I really don't get it. And the problem is, is that they're not exceedingly maneuverable, being large semi-trucks. They can't accelerate quickly. They don't stop quickly. They don't turn quickly. I understand that. But if you're in that situation, why would you get on a secondary road, I mean, well, even a tertiary road, uh, that really is made, uh, yeah, it can support trucks, don't get me wrong, but there's not businesses on it. So where is this guy going? How did he end up here? And it happens more often than not, and... Uh, you really want to get up into the cab and go, okay, let's take a quick poll. How did you get here, and what were you thinking? <laughs> Holy cow. And then the thing is, is that even when he gets on a big road that is well marked, he's sitting there driving 35 miles an hour in a 55. It's just, maybe it's just the people. I don't know. But it does, uh, does kind of make you wonder does make you wonder, okay, why? You know, if you just invested a little bit of money into, I don't know, a smartphone, Google Maps, you know, put a little suction cup thing on the window like I've got here so that it'll hold it for you, so it's visible, punch in an address, boom, you got it, you can get wherever you're going. It's not that hard. Ugh. I don't know. Maybe it's another case of obliviata. I don't know. I got a lot of respect for truck drivers. I truly do. Lord knows they put up with a lot of fools in cars. I get that. But sometimes, us fools in cars got to put up with a lot from them. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so I'm driving in traffic. Um, coming home, and, and normally I don't come this way. I'm, I had to do some stuff up in town, and I'm coming back, and I'm on interstate traffic. And, and one of the things that I'm noticing here is that there is a certain number of people who, for some reason, and I don't know why, when they see somebody coming in on a merging lane, absolutely refuse, refuse to get over to give this person any space. They refuse to speed up. They refuse to slow down. It's almost like they make it a point to match the other person's speed perfectly, forcing them to either speed up or slow down or run into the side of the other car. <laughs> and then, with the honking of horn and gestures and, and road rage and everything else, get upset that the other person, in fact, tries to merge. It's incredible! <laughs> now, I have a tendency to avoid highways just because, 
Well, there's a lot of people on highways, and I'm convinced half of them do not know how to drive courteously. <laughs> and it seems like every time that I get out on one of the larger highways and byways of the area, I am not disappointed, and the people that are in their personal vehicles do their utmost to convince me that, yes, indeed, there are people out here who are just bent on being discourteous and unaware that they could, if they chose, make life so much easier for everybody else. But yet, they choose not to. <laughs> I don't know, maybe maybe they use cans of goo and, and cartridge razors in the morning and it just sets the tone for the whole day and it just goes downhill from there, I don't know. But it seems to me that if you're driving down the road, you should be at least a little bit aware of what's going on around you and courteous to the drivers around you. I mean, nobody wants to get in a wreck, I don't believe, Nobody wants to be just, you know, that guy that just pisses everybody off, I don't believe. Um, especially seeing as how these are other people in cars in a fairly large community that she'll never see again and probably don't know from Adam's cat. It's just curious. But they really don't. They They just, they don't get out of each other's way. Now, for the most part, you know, you wonder why do trucks sit in the center lane of a three-lane highway? And it's mainly because in traffic, that way they don't have to get out of people's way when people are merging. They're already in the center lane. So they leave, you know, the left-hand lane for the people who are going faster. They take the center lane, and the right-hand lane is for people merging on. Makes sense. And from a professional driver's view, that's hopefully what they're thinking. On the other hand, there is a big difference between professional drivers and some of the people that are out here. <laughs> oh, it's just amazing. Turns without turn signals at night. Um, slow down without actually touching the brake pedal so that the guy behind you at night knows absolutely nothing until he's right on top of you. And then get mad at him for crashing into you. Well, did you, like, give him any indication at all? <laughs> it's just curious. It really is. It's one of these things where, you know, as you as you start to notice, you start to notice it more and more. And then, you know, when you throw on top of that, the people who have this incessant need to be on the telephone, and in the day and age of hand-free sets and speaker phones and... The ability to set the doggone thing, you know, up on the dash or, you know, in a holder or even in a cup holder and talk and have an intelligible conversation, people still apparently have this innate desire to hold the phone up to their ear so that they can talk with one hand and drive with the other in traffic, uh, which is, you know, fairly close packed together and going at a high rate of speed. <laughs> is it any wonder that we are on the verge of killing ourselves every time we get into a personal conveyance vehicle and uh, go from place to place at the same time, otherwise known as traffic? <laughs> it really is incredible. But the big thing that I wanted to point out was that it astounds me when you see a merge lane that you won't get out of the way. I do not, I, I do not, for the life of me, understand that. You can see the person merging. You can see the person coming up to speed in order to merge. And yet, you stay in the right-hand lane, matching speed with them almost perfectly, to the point where they either have to speed way up or slow way down, and they've been visible merging for a while. <laughs> it's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. <sighs> Bet those same people are fun at parties, huh? <laughs> So, 
After talking about trucks, after talking about merging, what do I find? <laughs> but a slowpoke law. <laughs> How about that? There is a uh, there is a state that is actually looking at enacting a slowpoke law that if you're uh, if you happen to be uh, driving at the speed limit or below the speed limit over in the passing lane, happens to be on the left hand side for those of you that uh, aren't familiar. Um, if you're happen happen to be driving slow in that lane instead of passing and then getting the heck over. Um, you can get ticketed. At least that's what they're proposing. It'll be interesting to see if it goes because, unfortunately, there is a lot of room for abuse of something like that. But yeah, kind of interesting that it falls on the heels of my uh, <clears throat> topics of trucks and merging and all that other good stuff that has to do with traffic control. All right. Well, today, today was not really a fun day. It was, uh, you know, I'm not going to say it was an eye-opener because I always knew that this kind of stuff can, can happen. But today is the day that we had an, an active shooter situation uh, out in California. And unfortunately, a bunch of people ended up dead and a bunch of people ended up hurt. And um, I hate when that happens. I absolutely hate when that happens. But... I happened to be looking, and it, this was last week that I was looking at it, and I was checking out the Art of Manliness. The Art of Manliness has a uh, has a, a blog post in there that says what to do in an active shooter situation, and I thought it was well, you know, it was timely, of course, but at the same time, it also offers some really good insight, and I'll explain why. Um, when I found out about this, I have a friend that has an alert, uh, uh, I guess, program or, or service that uh, when things like that happen, he gets he gets emails alerting him, and he's kind enough to pass them on. So I knew about it pretty much as soon as it happened, and uh, I did a couple of things. Number one, um, I have an app on my iPhone, and I know it's an iPhone, but I think it's also available for the Android, called Five O Radio. And 5 Radio allows you to listen to fire, uh, radio, uh, public service, EMS, uh, you know, those kind of radio transmissions from municipalities all over the country. And so I hooked into uh, the one that was for the, uh, the problem that was going on in California. And in fact, it was actually the uh, the tactical incident control channel that they were using, and so uh, it gave me a lot of insights. Okay, first off, you, if you don't know what's going on, and if you watch the news, I will tell you that listening to this, um, the folks that were involved in this knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, they had a route to get out. They used it. Uh, they went in there with a purpose, and. Uh, you know, all politics aside, whether you're for gun control, against the gun control, if you have people that are that have a plan and have a purpose and are going to do and willing to do whatever it takes, you're going to have a hard time stopping it. I mean, even the Secret Service knows this. If a guy is willing to die trying to shoot the president, he's probably going to shoot the president. It's, you know, there's not much they can do about it except potentially jump in front of it. And they're with him all day long. Okay. So with that said, one of the things that I was listening to is I was listening to some of the responses as these guys got away. Okay. So they got out of the main building and they went to another building. The officer that arrived on the scene, there is a protocol apparently that they follow that says... You have to have at least four officers in order to go in and engage, which means that even if there is time for a policeman to show up, it may not be his protocol to actually do anything yet to help. So there's more time that the people that want to do bad things can do bad things. Anyhow, the uh, the 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 reason that that is important is that there is uh, the first kind of headline, if you will, of this blog post is something to keep in mind. 
you're probably on your own. It says, in a study done by the FBI in 2014, it was discovered that most active shootings end in two minutes or less. That's not enough time for law enforcement to arrive. So when you start hearing gunshots in places you shouldn't be hearing gunshots, understand that you don't have very much time to think about what you should do. And in fact, what I will tell you is that the the officers that responded responded very quickly and then had to stop. And in fact, the dispatch actually asked if how many people they had with them. Now, part of it was to make sure that, you know, they account for everybody. I get that. But it was also painfully evident that there was a protocol in place and that they had to do this in a certain fashion and in a certain manner. And I understand that. They want to go home. I, I get that. The thing is, is that when you're on the other side, um, you want somebody there to help you. And the problem is there may not be someone there. They may be there, unfortunately, just to pick up the pieces. And that's a bad thing. So here's what you have to know. Okay. Um, you've got to know what you what do you want to do before anything actually happens, which means one of the things that you have to work at is situational awareness. And by that, what do I mean? Okay. When you walk into a building, do you know where all of the exits are? Not just the one that you came in, but all of them. Did you come by elevator? Okay, great. Do you know where the stairs are? Do you know if the stairs, if, you know, what floor you're on? Is it easier to get up? Is it easier to go down? Um, do you know how to get out of the class? You know, if you're in a classroom, for example, do you know how to get out? Do you know how to get around the office building if, say, the power fails and the lights go out? Okay. If it's something that you're used to, you probably have a lot of this knowledge in your, in your head, but don't know it. Okay. And so one of the things that, that it, this blog post talks about is think about it. Just think about it. Just having it in the forefront of your mind from time to time of, well, what would I do if something happened? Well, that's a big step right there because a lot of people don't even want to think about it. It becomes a normalcy bias. You know, when you're walking down a hallway, do you know where the exits are? Do you know where windows and doorways are? Do you know if the windows and doors will open? Are they emergency doors? Are they locked? Are they shut? You know, what What is the true situation? You know, for example, if you go to a hotel, do you know that most fire trucks will only reach the sixth floor? Um, a lot of people don't know that. So when you're getting a hotel room, try to get one on the sixth floor or lower if possible. Gives you another option. Okay. The other thing is... When you run into a situation, when there's an active situation that is occurring, use the knowledge that you've acquired to do a couple of things. One of three things, actually. Run, hide, and fight. And in that order. Okay, the, the first objective is, you know, you have a flight response that is given to you by Mother Nature. Okay, use it. Run away if you can. Okay, get to a safe place. If somebody is causing harm over there, don't go over there. Don't freeze in place. Leave. That's all I can say about that. You know, if you have the opportunity to leave, leave. Okay. If you don't have the opportunity to leave, hide. Okay. Now, there's a thing about hiding. Something that we used to do in the Navy, which was kind of fun. Um, and it kind of goes along with the next one, which is called fight. Well, if you're hiding, and if you're fighting, okay, either one, use the environment that you probably know very, very well to your advantage. You know, for example, if you hide, turn out the lights, um, do it and so you know, Break the lights, you know, so that nobody can come and turn them on. Do something so that you have that natural advantage of, well, I know everything in the room, but some stranger doesn't. Um, you know, give yourself those advantages. If if you can uh, get behind a locked door, uh, great. 
if you can get behind a locked door that has an exit on, you know, in the same room, um, yeah, do that and then go out the exit. <laughs> you know, the first thing that you want to do is leave in all situations. You know, you, you want to get yourself in a position where you can leave. Uh, if you have to hide, okay, great. And if you have to fight, well, do it with purpose. Do it with malice intent. Because I guarantee you that whatever you're fighting against had malice in their heart to begin with. And in order to win and in order to survive, you have to ratchet up to that same level. Um, otherwise, you know, if you just, you know, you see it all the time in the movies, okay? And we laugh about it, all right? Somebody hits somebody in the head and knocks them out. But that's it. And then they, you know, walk over and find out if somebody else is okay. And the bad guy jumps back up. And next thing you know, the bad guy's winning. You don't want that. Okay. Uh, anyhow, as sad as the events are, and, uh, and my prayers truly go out to the families that have been just devastated, absolutely devastated by this. And in fact, it's not the first time that it's happened. And Unfortunately, it won't be the last, but uh, it is a reality, and we need to face that reality, because whether they have uh, laws in place to prevent this or not, and I dare say that we already do, um, there are people intent on harm. You know, if you look at what happened in Paris, for example, the weapons that were used were illegal. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the the Boston bomber situation, okay, the bombs were illegal. It didn't stop anybody. If intent to do harm is in someone's heart, harm will occur, period. And the problem is, is that while you're sitting there praying and hoping that somebody comes to help, the policemen are outside waiting for backup before protocol will allow them to come in and pick up the pieces. Something to think about. Anyhow, check out the Art of Manliness uh, blog post. I'll put a link to it. It's got a lot of good stuff in there. Well, that concludes this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you have some suggestions or would like a topic covered, drop me an email at brushandsoapandblade at gmail.com or give me a call at 864-372-6234 or contact us on Twitter at Brush and Blade. You can also visit us at our blog, brushandsoapandblade.wordpress.com. As always, we're available on iTunes and Stitcher. 